I'm Thomas Baldrick along with Rita Wickham, PhD, RN, now working primarily as a consultant and author. She joins us here at ASCO 2013 to discuss her work in the areas of quality of life and CINV. Thanks for being with us. Oh, thank you for having me, Tom. You look lovely in hot pink. Thank you. I thought it was a nice change from the black I'm seeing all go. over. Let's, let's t start with a, a look at what CINV is. CINV is the acronym for chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting, so you can understand why it's CINV. But it really is something that occurs over, uh, possibly for some patients, for many days. So it can happen in the first 24 hours after chemotherapy is given. That's acute. You can have delayed that as the subsequent 24 hours to five days, six days, even 10 days for some patients, and their nausea is worse than vomiting. And you can have breakthrough. If people aren't managed well, they can have anticipatory. So it's a very complex issue. Rita, I, I looked at, in your work, you're, you're looking at it from a couple of perspectives, the physiologic standpoint, as well as financially. Can yes. you talk about that? Well, physiologically, um, I've been interested in this area for a long, long time. In fact, the first paper I published was in 1982. At that time, I was wondering, would anybody inter be interested in that topic? And I've just maintain an interest. So in terms of the physiology, we've learned a lot, uh, particularly since about the 1980s, we've learned much more in terms of how it happens. We know it's complex. Uh, we know it involves multiple neural inputs. Um, and because the nervous system is characterized by plasticity, you have to you have to target more than one pathway because there's more than one way for an important message like vomiting to get into the brain, uh, the area of the brain that controls this. So, leave it to, needless to say, uh, we've learned a lot about uh, sites of action. We've learned about neurotransmitters and receptors. Those are things that we can now target with new drugs. Um, and we've come a long way. When you talk about financially, what's happened is while we have become a lot better at controlling CINV for 70 or 80 percent of patients. Nausea, particularly delayed nausea, is still a major problem. The new drugs, uh, supportive care drugs, are very expensive and unfortunately there are not many studies that are done with, with other areas of nausea and vomiting that cancer patients might have. And so we get kind of limited as to how we can use these drugs and in fact they can be quite expensive these days. Uh, it wouldn't be unusual, for instance, if somebody was getting something that was moderately or highly likely to cause nausea and vomiting, that their antiemetics might be four or $500 a, a, a cycle or a course of chemotherapy. So it's, it is very expensive. And insurance will pay a lot of that, but it won't pay all of it. And the, the patient themselves may end up with quite a copay, particularly if they're taking several different drugs in a month. So Rita, if, if a person has cancer, that's already stressful enough. It is. But, but when you add in that they can't do the things in life that they want to do, the things that br bring mm. them pleasure, and the things they need to do, right. such as work to take care of a family, earn a living, and pay for the right. treatment, it really makes it much more difficult, doesn't it? It does. And you know, this is just one of the symptoms um, in terms of financially, going back to what you know, and it doesn't relate solely, obviously, to antiemetics, uh, but it relates to the cost of treatment, the cost of lost work, as you might mention, that the rate of personal bankruptcies in people with cancer is, is actually much higher than the general population. I think it's probably close to double. And in younger people, it's a bigger problem than in older people. Rita, in, uh, in researching your books, I was really hit by one of the quotes, and I'd like to read it to you. It came from a 52-year-old female cancer patient, and she said this about her chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting. It's the worst thing in the world. It's worse than my pain. I can't eat, nothing tastes good, and I just don't feel like doing anything. How many people out there are like her? You know, it's really difficult to ascertain because the one area where doctors and nurses kind of fall down, and it's probably because there's not an easy way to do this, and we're busy, is that we don't go back and ask the patient on the days after chemotherapy how they're doing. And people tend to suffer in silence. You know, this is part of the treatment, um, particularly if it's kind of like, I'm not retching and vomiting, but I just feel cruddy all the time. Um, I don't feel like doing anything. Now my quality of life is really impaired. Um, I found that in some research that I did where people just said, you know, if I knew what this was going to be like, I wouldn't do this again. 
and I, not everybody is like that, but we're stuck with imagining, I tell people to imagine that this is their mother who's coming for chemotherapy or their daughter, or their sister, their husband, because men have problems too. Imagine what they would want for that individual and they would want the best that they can have. So impaired quality of life, it's really a problem. I mentioned to you earlier um, anticipatory symptoms. If somebody is nausea and vomiting, not well controlled, they can develop food aversions, they can have anticipatory symptoms that are really, they're evoked by, you know, a smell. Um, I walk someplace and I smell an alcohol wipe, a nurse wearing a particular perfume, which nurses don't do anymore. The clinic where I first worked, the uh, secretaries, when we got a microwave, they started making microwave popcorn. Microwave popcorn, the smell of popcorn, people became averse to, it just made them feel nauseated. And so that sort of becomes um, a sort of with the emotions of having nausea. And that can last for a long time. It can last for 10 or 10 or 12 years afterwards, and that's as far as we followed people. So it's a real major problem in terms of quality of life effects. And I personally think, although there's little research in this area, that when we don't do a good job in managing CINV, if we have somebody who unfortunately develops progressive cancer and then has nausea for another reason, Number one, we don't have as many drugs, we don't have as much research, they may not be affordable, but that anticipatory nausea and vomiting may increase that person's risk for having debilitating uh, symptoms then too. So it's really something that we still need to pay attention to. So what are best practices with CINV? We have over the last, oh, at least 15 years, there are uh, three major organizations. ASCO is one of them. Uh, NCCN, National Coalition of Cancer Centers, is another, and MASC, the Multinational Association for Supportive Care in Cancer, have come out with guidelines uh, for managing CINV. Those are evidence-based, so there are some limitations because some studies were never done and won't be done, but they're the place to start for people. They're pretty similar. The other um, strategy or uh, uh, thing that's available for people is the Oncology Nursing Society has uh, PEP uh, cards, putting um, evidence into practice. And that really looks at what were best practices. So in terms of looking at that, you can look at um, these guidelines and you can say, okay, for our setting, if we have patients who are getting this particular chemotherapy, this is where we should start. So it tells you what are the standard of care antiemetics particularly for people who are getting highly and moderately metagenic chemotherapy. And not only what should we do today, the day the patient's getting chemotherapy, but what we should we do when the patient goes home and they're at risk for having delayed symptoms. Um, they're very good. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of people don't use them. And a lot of patients are still not even getting standard of care antiemetics. And another limitation is that there's no plan B involved with these. So here's what you do up front. Um, this is the, our recommendations. What should we do if this doesn't work out quite as well as we thought it should? We should be doing something else. That's an area where perhaps we want to look at some, you know, clinical, re, uh, clinical review papers and that sort of thing. Very good. Thanks for sharing with us, Rita. Okay. Thank Enjoyed you. It. Rita Wickham, PhD, RN, talking about CINV here at ASCO 2013.